I want to thank our guests for being here. I do look around and see a couple of guests with us, uh, family and, and others, and we, uh, we thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure to gather together. I don't know about you, but I have, for whatever reason, really enjoyed worshiping with you this morning, and uh, I've just been uh, challenged a little bit this morning with some of the thoughts. I didn't know some of those songs you led this morning, so it was particularly uh, that doesn't happen often with me, so I, that was enjoyable to be able to think of some new thoughts that I've not considered before in the words of those hymns. Uh, hopefully, worship has been good for you this morning also. <clears throat> the other day, uh, probably two or three weeks ago, I was out on the mower, and this doesn't happen often. I, I typically, when I'm mowing, I, I have some noise-canceling uh, big old headphones that connect to my phone, and I listen to sermons while I mow. Odd, I know, but hey, it's, uh, it's what I do. So I was listening to a sermon, and I had to stop mowing so that I could take out my phone and write down what this guy had said. It, it was, I thought, a very good definition of discouragement. And it good because he had taught this lesson at a very timely point for me and just being discouraged about some things. And I think probably all of us, based on the definition that he gave, probably feel this type of discouragement quite often. Uh, let me put the, put the definition up here for you. He said that when you have a sustained struggle and you add to that an uncertain timeline, and then add on top of that social isolation, it always leads to discouragement. Think about those three things. Sustained struggle. Having to fight the same battle over and over again. Waking up every day with the same pain or with the same frustration or the same sense of, of, of betrayal or the same uh, bad news, that just that sustained struggle with an uncertain timeline. You're not really sure if it's going to get better, when it will get better, if it does, or maybe even it will get worse. And then you add to that that sense of social isolation where you feel alone in your struggle or you feel removed from others because of the circumstances you cannot help but de be discouraged. What particularly got me about this definition was that you add this definition, which is a regular part of life. We all face these three aspects which lead to, di to discouragement, but you add to that that we have all been through at least a year of these three things because of the pandemic, because of the things that are going on, the political battles, the race wars, and all of the things that are happening in our world, we are currently, all of us, in some sense or another, experiencing a sustained struggle in this world. We have no timeline as to when things are going to get better, and the timelines that we are given constantly shift back and forth, and then we are told that we had to, for a year, socially isolate from one another. It is not surprising that many of us have faced discouragement. I mean, we, we've all experienced at least that. And then there are many of us who, because of particular issues, have experienced this in other ways on top of what we all experienced in 2020. We're discouraged. The difficulty with discouragement is that it often leads to depression which then leads to disengagement with the community or the world around you, which then leads to a feeling of despair and ultimately defeat. That, that's where many of us are. Luckily, the Bible has answers for this, and the Bible has examples of this. And the Bible has things in it that can help us realize 
that our sustained struggle and our uncertain timeline and our social isolation really aren't things that we have to deal with. Because ultimately, our sustained struggle is limited and our uncertain timeline does have an end for you and me and that we don't have to be socially isolated because we are a part of a kingdom. And I think when we realize that we truly have the answer to discouragement, we don't have to, to, to diminish into depression or distancing ourselves from others or despair because God gave us answers. You know, ultimately in discouragement, what makes it difficult is that it tends to creep up on us. We don't realize it's happening. We, we realize the sustained struggle because that's, that's everyday life, but we don't realize how that is affecting us over the long term. And so it tends to creep up on us until it eventually starts to take over us and we just find ourselves feeling flattened. I really don't know a better word for it. Flattened. We just feel insignificant. We feel like, like there's not really much we can do. We just, we, it ends up taking over us and it overwhelms us and we, we get to the point to where as we try to get ourselves out of this or we try to logically talk ourselves out of feeling this way, we, we get frustrated and angry with ourselves because we can't get out of it. And then, then it just drives us deeper into this feeling of discouragement and then eventually depression and disengagement. And then we start to condemn ourselves and beat up on ourselves and feel like we are, we are doing wrong or we are being sinful or we, that we have not done the things that we need to do. And it eventually just makes us want to quit. We are not alone in this. And that's what I think sometimes we don't realize. We, we have grown up in a church culture that has emphasized Philippians 4.4. 4. You know what Philippians 4.4 4 says, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We, we, that, that's what we have been taught is the expectation, but it's not. I'm not saying that that shouldn't be what we do. I'm saying I think we misunderstand how to apply it. Because the point is not that we have to be uh, bubbly, overjoyed, happy-go-lucky people. Because there are plenty of heroes of faith who weren't that. There are times of discouragement. It's like the writer of Ecclesiastes says. There is a time for laughter and there is a time for sorrow. And we've got to realize there's a time for both. And that God gives us the answer in both of those situations. Need I remind you of Abraham? Abraham, a, a great man of faith, right? The father of the faithful. Abraham, a man who was called to leave his home, and he obediently did so without knowing where he was going. Y'all remember that story, right? Abraham, a man who even in his old age was promised that he would have descendants that were more numerous than the sands of the seashore and more numerous than the stars of the sky. Abraham, a man that we look at and we see he was a man who held fast to God no matter what. So if you look over in Genesis chapter 15, God says this great thing to him there in verse 1 in a vision. Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. You ever noticed what Abraham or Abram at this point's response to that is? Verse 2. Oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Let me put that in other terms for you. God, I have no kids as you've promised, so I've already appointed my heir to be the servant who will take my name, and he can make it great. Why 
if he truly believes that God's going to give him and Sarah an heir, is he appointing some servant as the, as the heir? Well, the thing is, and what, what we often don't put together, is that God hasn't really given him any details yet. God told him that your descendants will be great, but God didn't necessarily say they would be from your seed. What God has just said is, you'll have many descendants. Well, legally, culturally, he could make a servant his heir, and therefore that heir could have children, and that could be his descendants. They could carry on his name. You find a little bit later where you've got the episode of Sarai and Hagar, right? Well, God up until that point never said that it was going to be your child with Sarah. It just said your child. That's what God promises him here in 15. And so Sarah comes up with the idea of, well, I can't have children, so have children with Hagar. That was completely in line with the way the law and the culture said they should act. Why do you think Abraham went through all these extra steps? Because he was discouraged. He didn't understand how God's plan could ever come true. He didn't doubt God's plan, but he didn't understand God's plan. And so he went different routes. What about Joseph? Joseph's story is full of ups and downs, right? Uh, He's the favorite, but he's also the despised. He's sold into slavery, but he becomes the head slave, but then he gets thrown into jail. So he becomes the head uh, prisoner, and then he's forgotten. And then he becomes second in command of all of Egypt. But look with me over in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 51. Joseph starts having children, and so he names his firstborn Manasseh, for, he said, God has made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. Years have passed since he was thrown in the pit. But is he still troubled by what has happened? Yeah. You read the name of his next child, Ephraim, For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. How did Joseph view Egypt? It was torture living there. You think Joseph was discouraged on occasion? Do you think he faced depressing thoughts? Do you think he even on occasion felt despair? You look at Elijah. Elijah chapter, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, or chapter 18, you've got the story of the, uh, that conflict with the prophets of Baal, and Jezebel said she's going to kill him. And you look over in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. Here you've got Elijah. He, he's on the run for his life. Jezebel has promised to kill him. And he says here, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father. What's he want? To die. Do you think he felt despair? Do you think he felt discouraged? Nehemiah, the whole story of Nehemiah is an incredible story, but over and over again it talks about the obstacles that he ran into both with the people he was leading as they rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem and the people that were around Jerusalem who were casting insults and causing trouble and writing letters to stop the progress on the rebuilding of the wall. And Nehemiah had to constantly go back and direct the people to get back to work. You think he felt discouraged? doing all of that. We're told Peter wept after denying the Lord. Do you think he felt discouraged? We're told that he was distressed whenever Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? He was discouraged. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
over here, Paul, in this letter to the church, talks about comforting those who are afflicted. And look down in verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril. He will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. Nehemiah, Peter, Paul, Need we go into Moses and David and Elisha, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the different prophets that we know felt discouraged, not even just because of the circumstances of life, but in doing the work God had commissioned them to do. Many have been discouraged. But all of them, and here's the thing they have in common, all of them learned to trust in the Lord through the discouragement. I, look with me again here, Second Corinthians chapter 1. He says here, talked about despairing even of life, that he had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. You hear that in? God delivers from discouragement. God. God is the one in whom we place our hope. God is the one in whom we find our answer. God is the one who rescues. I think we forget that sometimes. We live in an independent culture that tells us that we have to handle all of our problems on our own, don't we? Haven't you been tempted to feel that way when you're discouraged? That you got to get out of this yourself. That you, just, you just have to make up your mind that, that you're going to feel better tomorrow. That's the lie we tell ourselves. Or you, you convince yourself, oh, well, if, if, if I just had a change in circumstances, Things, things would be better. It's a lie we tell ourselves. Or, or we, we, we're convinced that, that if we just handle it this way or have this conversation or, or, or do this other thing or make this decision that, that everything gets better. None of that's true. The truth is the only answer for discouragement is God. Because he's the only constant and steady thing in our lives. You see, what we've got to recognize is that life is filled with discouragement. We all face trials and difficulties. And I'll be honest, the devil is really good at timing. Have you ever noticed that? You know, we have an expression that we use, and I, I've, I've seen it play out so many times over the years. The expression is, when it rains, everybody knows the end, right? It pours. What does that mean? That means when one bad thing happens, you're going to have a bunch of bad things that happen. It, it, it's just the way life works. Things don't, bad things don't happen in singularities. They always happen in pluralities. The reason for that is this. The devil knows that if he can hit you over and over and over again, that's where discouragement comes from. Think back to the life of Job. Hard to talk about this topic and not talk about Job, right? Right there at the very beginning of the story, and you've got that contest between Satan, the adversary, and God. And God says, have you considered my servant Job and Satan? says, well, of course he's, he's faithful. You've built this hedge around him. You've made life so good. Have you ever paid attention to the timing at the beginning of the book of Job? At the way everything unfolds? Look with me there. Job chapter 1. I want you to see the timing here. Job chapter 1. 
Verse 13, now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. The Sabaeans attacked and took them. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed your sheep. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, Another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made raids on the camels. Verse 18, While he was still speaking, another came and said, Your sons and daughters were in the house, and a great wind came and collapsed the house on them. Do you notice the timing of all of that? While he was still speaking. It wasn't one thing. It was when it rains, it pours. It was over and over and over and over again. It was being hit over and over and over again. I used to love to watch boxing. And I've noticed with boxing, rarely ever is it the single hit that wins the, the bout. It's when you're able to get the combos in, right? The left, left, right combo unless you're Rocky, and then it's right, right, left to South Paul. That's the way it goes, right? I mean, it, you've, you've got this, the, the, the combo. That's where you really fall down. It's when you get hit with the combo. The devil is a master of combos. He's good at it. He knows that's when we get defeated. He knows that it, it's not going to be one thing that gets you. If it's one thing, even if it's a big thing, we can carry through that. We can, we can be strong. But when it's a bunch of things, even if they're small things, that's what defeats us. And that's how life is. You, even being a Christian can feel discouraging because we're still living life. I'm going to tell you that the first thing we've got to do if we're going to come through discouragement is that we have to face the lies of discouragement. We've already mentioned several of them in this lesson, but let me mention them again. First of all is this. Understand you are not alone. You aren't. You're not alone in discouragement. Generally speaking, if somebody is suffering, there's somebody else suffering from the same thing. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you, God says. Do not look anxiously about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even if there is no other human on earth who can understand what you're going through, who does? God. That's the reason I've, I've said from the very beginning of this lesson, the answer is found in turning to God. But what you find in Scripture is that it's not just God who cares for you. As Peter says, cast your burdens on me. I care for you from God's perspective in 1 Peter 5, 7. God cares for us, but it's not just God who cares for us, it, it's one another. We care for each other, and we walk with each other. I have always found it to be telling that God never permitted Christians to be Christians alone. Do you see that anywhere in Scripture? It is interesting to me that even when Jesus sent out his 70 disciples, how did he send them? Two by two. He, he sent them as groups. He sent them with partners because he understands that when we are alone, we are discouraged. What are we told over in Genesis chapter 1 or chapter 2 when God made Adam and Eve? It says that when he created Adam, he said to to us, it is not good for man to be alone. What are we told in Ecclesiastes? Two are better than one. Why? Because when one falls down, there's someone there to pick him up, 
think of falling down figuratively. When one is discouraged, when one is beat down, when one suffers, there is somebody there to lift them up. What are we told? Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. How many times through Scripture do we see relationships being the foundation of what we are as the church? It is important that we realize we are not alone. We're told that we are not overwhelmed. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. We know that. Uh, there, there's nothing that can overwhelm us because we have God on our side. Uh, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know what? I, Paul there in Philippians chapter 4 in that context is talking about money. Do you know what thing gets most of us discouraged most often? Money. It's money. We don't have enough. We're worried about how life's going to be. How are we going to afford this? How are we going to be able to buy this? I really want my kids to have this. And so we get discouraged and distracted by money. Paul says, you know what? No. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you don't have those worries. You don't have that discouragement. Realize that just because of discouragement, we are not condemned. That's one of those lies that that discouragement tells us, that, well, because you feel bad, because you feel discouraged, because you feel upset, you're doing something wrong. That is not true. It becomes wrong when we don't turn to God during those moments. That's when discouragement turns wrong. And so we've got to realize those times of discouragement, those times of stress and distress are there to give us opportunities to lean on God. Shouldn't we be doing that a little more? Lean on God. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials. For once he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Notice that? Persevere. Trials aren't easy. Trials aren't fun. Trials aren't uh, happiness creators. That was awkward, I know. <laughs> that, that, that Trials aren't what we look forward to in life. But they're part of what we need. And if we will trust in God during those trials and persevere, we will draw closer to him and they will be exactly what brings us strength. We need to lean on our community. We already talked about that some, but you know, we, we should take strength from those who have gone on before, whether those be biblical characters that we see and can, can associate with or find commonality with. There's also one another. And this requires us to get to know one another during the good time so that we know who we can rely on and lean on during the tough times. And I think that's probably the place in which we fail most often in these relationships. We, we don't realize how much we need each other until we actually need each other and then it's a little too late. We need to be the kind of people who, who take strength from one another. We need to spend some time together talking about heaven. We don't do that enough. We don't imagine just how grand and glorious it's going to be enough. You know what gets us through the discouragement of this world more than any other thing? The fact that this world is not our home. But it's hard to really believe that when this is the only thing we ever think about. But if we would gather together and talk about heaven and the glory of heaven and how much we're looking forward to heaven and how great it's going to be to stand around God and, and, and cast our crowns at his feet and to bow down and to see the glory of what that world is like as opposed to what this world is and all of its failures. And we, we imagine all the people we're going to see there and the fact that it'll be like this grand family reunion we hope, we think, we pray. 
how do you how do you not look forward to that and it's like paul says you know that that is so far greater than anything we have to endure here that it makes anything we endure here worth it. The reason we don't endure things here well is because we haven't spent enough time thinking about what's there. Maybe we would be served well in doing that as a group of people. We need to be fellowshipping with one another. We're talking about that a lot over this in the next two months, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. We need to treat each uh, one another individually. Turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Here we're told, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Here's what I take away from that verse. Besides the individual pieces, it's this. Every person's situation requires something different from me. There are some people who need to be admonished. There are some people who need to be encouraged. There are some people who need to be rebuked. There are some people who need to just be celebrated with. There are some people I need to sit down and weep with. But every person deserves something different from me, and I have to know them well enough to know what I should be giving them. The one thing that everyone deserves, though, is patience. And that's the one thing we're probably, we failed the most at, being patient with them. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is vain, or is your toil is not in vain in the Lord. I love that all that we do for God, God cares about. God keeps an accounting of it. God knows. And that it will not be vain for God. Because I think sometimes that's what we get discouraged about. Of it, it, the, anything we do really matter. To God, it does. Last thing is this. I think we need to know that God's cheering for us. Have you ever thought about that? Back when I was in high school, I wrestled and uh, loved it. And I, I was trying to become a better wrestler, so I decided to uh, ask my dad if he would take our big old massive camcorder, because that's how they were back then, and videotape me wrestling so that I could watch it from like a third-party point of view and I could see what I did well, what I did poorly, what I needed to work on. And so I wanted videos of it. Well, first time I got the video, watched it. The second time I got the video, watched it, and got mad. The reason I got mad was this, is that I had made a big mistake in the match, and, and I wanted to see it. But instead of recording me, my dad was recording my mom in the stand because she's over there in the bleachers going, get him, get him, get him, get him doing all of that and granted it was hilarious now I look back on that and I realize how much my mom cheered for me and it encourages me as good as that feeling is I have a God who is cheering for me who is urging me on, who is pushing me forward, who is loving me both from a distance of his throne and from close by. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. You know who's filling that cup? Him. Him. When I realize that God is cheering for me, I can't help but feel better. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Notice the next verse. And the peace of God, which surpasses comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, or starting in verse 16. Therefore do not, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Your God is walking with you. Your God is filling your cup. Your God is caring for you. Your God is preparing a place for you. Your God is making things good. Brothers and sisters, keep your eyes on God, and that solves every issue. Everyone. It's a wonderful thing to belong to that kind of God, is it not? None of what I said today is easy. When you're in the middle of being discouraged or you're fighting despair, it's not easy. None of what I'm saying today is a quick fix. <laughs> That's the thing about it. It takes a while to creep into discouragement, and sometimes it takes a while to climb out of it. And I'll be honest, it's a whole lot harder to climb than it is to creep. But it doesn't change the fact that it is the answer. The answer to discouragement is to keep your eyes on a God who loves you so much that he stands with you, he cheers for you, he provides for you, he has provided answers and salvation for you, he has given you everything. And as we studied in our adult class this morning in Ezekiel, you've got this picture of God who has taken a, a thrown away baby and has brought her into his home and has raised her and clothed her and adorned her and loved on her and doted on her. That's how God treats us. We just got to stick with him. I encourage you, if, if if you're struggling with despair, you're struggling with difficulties and the way you think about life, the way you feel, let people know. There's comfort in knowing you've got people praying for you, you've got people who are watching out for you, loving you. But most of all, let God know. Because God only can fill your heart with a peace that surpasses understanding. Hey, for some of you, the, the first answer is become a child of God in the first place. There is nothing more distressing than existing without him because you're lost. The best you have to look forward to is this because what comes after this is destruction. It's 